This conference will now be recorded. So today we will discuss this very important talk regarding HMB, heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, it is as important as your NICE guidelines for HMB, okay? So there are two parts. One is part one and part two. Don't neglect these two, two talks. These two talks are very important. Every time you get at least one or two SBS from these talks or EMQs, okay? So we will start with this talk today. And tomorrow in continuation, I will take part two also. Because these are the big, uh, big talks. That is each and every sentence from this talk is important, okay? So regarding magnitude of HMB, 20%, that is one in five premenopausal women, they have this HMB and it significantly impairs their quality of life. According to NICE guidelines, HMB definition is excessive menstrual blood loss, which interferes with women's physical, social, emotional and or material quality of life. So this HMB definition, it is not related to the quantity or quality, but it is related to the quality of life. Okay. The HMB definition is related to the quality of life. Now, this talk is regarding not medical management, but regarding surgical management of this HMB. So, surgical treatment options for HMB are endometrial ablation, hysterectomy, and myomectomy. So, this part one talk, it deals with endometrial ablation, while the in part two, they have discussed regarding other surgical options, that is hysterectomy and myomectomy. So, today, we will discuss in detail regarding the endometrial ablation. Now, regarding the general information regarding this HMB, as you know, according to NICE guidelines, uh, when the patient comes with HMB, initial history and examination should be conducted and appropriate investigation should be carried out. So, appropriate investigation according to NICE guidelines means only full blood count, okay? So, first investigation that is to be done is full blood count, okay? And then either ultrasound or hysteroscopic biopsy now according to new guidelines new 2000 this talk is of 2017 and the new guideline has come in 2018 so according to 2018 guideline there is no role for blind endometrial biopsy that is pupil biopsy no role for pupil biopsy in hmb but the only two things regarding investigation what they have given is one is transvaginal ultrasound and another is uh, hysteroscopy guided biopsy, either only hysteroscopy or hysteroscopy guided biopsy. So, in specifically, what they have mentioned is full blood count should be done for everyone and physical examination. Okay. And now, even physical examination, also, if uh, she is not having a major complaint, then you can just start her on tranexamic acid or OC pills. Okay. And then uh, after physical examination, if you feel her uh, regarding, uh, according to her complaint, you have to either do ultrasound or do hysteroscopic biopsy. So ultrasound should be done for the patients who are having palpable uterus, that is abdominally palpable uterus, while hysteroscope or you are suspecting any pelvic mass. Okay, and for hysteroscopy guided biopsy, when the patient is having inter intermenstrual bleeding, or when you are suspecting any endometrial pathology like endometrial polyp or whether the patient is having persistent bleeding, persistent irregular bleeding, and the, when the uh, patient is having risk factors like age more than 45 years, or the patient is having PCO. In those cases, the endometrial biopsy, that is hysteroscopy guided biopsy is recommended. So these are the only three investigations that are to be done in HMB. So in the absence of any structural or histological anomalies, nice what the first choice of treatment is, Mirena, that is Leonogestrel IUS. And other medical management is tranexamic acid or combined ossicles. These are the first line medical managements for HMB. And the surgical option, as I told you, it is the endometrial ablation, myomectomy, and hysterectomy. So, regarding endometrial ablation, so endometrial ablation, it is the permanently destroyed. It is the procedure where the endometrium is permanently destroyed. And what do you mean by permanently dis permanent destruction of endometrium is functionally active endometrial glands. That is the basal layer or at the endomyometrial junction. So 5 mm of myometrium. So total full endometrium and up to 5 millimeter of myometrium is ablated. Okay. So this is the SBA. Remember well. So whole endometrium and up to 5 millimeter of myometrium is ablated. Now, this is developed as a less invasive alternative to hysterectomy. 
it has it can be offered to women who have completed their family and who don't desire for future future fertility okay so it is only given this option is only for the women who whose family has been completed and the regarding the examination the uterus up to 10 weeks okay so up to 10 weeks of uterus you can offer this endometrial ablation the endometrial ablation the techniques are uh, divided into first generation techniques and second generation techniques first generation techniques these are um, hysteroscopy guided techniques and these are their learning curve is more for first generation technique while second generation techniques these are quicker and these are safer and simpler to learn so wherever uh, possible this second generation techniques are recommended for this ha uh, hmb for uh, when you are going to do endometrial ablation the second generation techniques are more recommended than first generation now what are the first generation techniques and what are the second generation techniques so in the first generation techniques they use hysteroscopy so it is a hysteroscopic guided procedure Where uh, a total endometrium and uh, superficial myometrium up to five millimeter is ablated. Here, they require distension of uterine cavity using any fluid. Either it is a galacin. So remember, when say when monopolar hysteroscope, when uh, monopolar uh, energy devices are used, the distension medium is glycine, and when the bipolar energy devices are used, the distension medium is normal saline. And with the use of resectoscope. it is usually this first generation endometrial ablation is performed so the techniques which are used in first generation are trans cervical resection of endometrium and roller ball endometrial ablation so these account uh, in before 1995 they accounted that is first generation uh, endometrial ablation techniques they accounted for at least 80% of all endometrial ablations so what is done in trans cervical resection so here can you see this two diagram or uh, two pictures so here you can see this black color so this is the re resectoscope it is a 3 cent 3 mm uh, electrosurgical loop it is connected to the energy device and by this uh, you are doing the endometrial ablation under hysteroscopic guidance so here the glycine is circulated in the uterine cavity through intra outflow channels and monopolar blend current of 80 to 100 watt is used so when monopolar current is used the distension medium is glycine when by now the bipolar energy uh, bipolar also resectoscopes have come so for bipolar you can use normal saline but what is the disadvantage with normal saline is this blood gets mixed up with this normal saline and it will hamper the view okay hamper the view of the cavity in case of heavy bleeding but the advantage of tcr is remember the two advantages of this trans cervical resection one is you can take tissue for biopsy okay so one is you can take tissue for biopsy and another thing is you can treat other pathologies like small submucous fibroids or polyps you can remove simultaneously with this tcr so this is the most versatile of first generation technique but it has the longest generation uh, longest learning curve and highest risk of complications the second technique in first generation is roller ball ablation so roller ball ablation it is a small ball like electrode is used instead of this loop okay and same thing like of uh, up to 5 mm of myometrium superficial myometrium is destroyed but here you will not get any tissue for biopsy because you are just rolling the ball okay to ablate the tissue that is you are going to char the tissue but you are not going to take any uh, take out any tissue for histopathology it is safer over the areas where myometrium is relatively thin like cornea or cesarean scar previous cesarean scar okay and it can be used alone or it can be combined with tcre the results are similar to tcre but risk of complication is less now one more thing that you should remember regarding this roller ball ablation is whenever repeat endometrial ablation is required this is the choice of method so whenever the repeat already first ablation is done and she wants uh, because of persistent hmb uh, second endometrial ablation is required in that case this roller ball ablation is the preferred method for the repeat ablations now third thing is in the first generation is laser ablation endometrial laser ablation here what is a laser cable that is 600 micrometer flexible quartz fiber is inserted through the Operating channel of hysteroscope and the laser used is NDR laser. 
okay the power used is from 50 watts to 80 watts and this bare fiber dragging technique is used to draw the furrows in the endometrium so that it is ablated this technique is rarely used so this is the rarely used technique but the, remember one uh, which laser is used for this laser ablation is ndr laser now second generation so these are the three first generation techniques one is tcre that is transmetal resection of endometrium second is roller ball ablation and third is laser ablation now in second generation techniques remember well hysteroscopy so it is not hysteroscopy guided second generation techniques are not hysteroscopy guided but the exception is hydrothermal ablation so this hydrothermal ablation of second generation techniques it require simultaneous hysteroscopy so it is, it is a hysteroscopy guided but other second generation techniques they are not hysteroscopy guided they are less dependent on surgeon skill quicker to learn and safer to use these techniques are suitable up to 10 to 12 weeks of uterus and submucous fibroids not greater than 3 centimeters while the manufacturers of second generation techniques they do not advocate pre insertion hysteroscopy but mhra mhra means medicine and health regulatory authority or agency it recommends prior hysteroscopy to rule out any false passage or perforation so ideally hysteroscopy pre insertion hysteroscopy should be done and then only this technique should be used this is of particularly important because if any dilatation is required if there is any history of previous cesarean section or if uterus is acutely antiverted or retroverted or if there is suspicion of adhesions so in that case you have to confirm that there is no false passage or there is no perforation before introducing the second generation devices now what are the devices which are used for second generation techniques so it is a thermal balloon ablation the first thing is thermal balloon ablation so you can see it is a catheter silicon catheter and a balloon okay so here this balloon contains hot liquid and this uh, catheter is inflated inside it and it is circulated a hot liquid is circulated so here this there are two things two devices are available one is thermotis and cavatum so they use 5% dextrose at the temperature of 87 or 78 degree centigrade and the uh, and another thing is a meno trick it is a another balloon device it, it uses temperature at circulating it, it uses saline and it uses the temperature is 85 degree centigrade and pressure for all this is you can see the pressure is between 160 to 250 okay that is 150 to 200 millimeters of mercury the pressure is used also there is another device that is thermablade it is a device which use glycerin at 173 degree centigrade now these things you are not supposed to remember so what contains what and which are the devices it is not uh, it is there is no need to remember these all devices just they have given the information but no need to use here what you have to uh, remember is a circulating hot liquid is used to ablate the endometrium the treatment cycle varies between 2 to 10 minutes okay and what happens the mechanism a mechanism of action for this thermal balloon ablation is so this high temperature and high pressure it causes endovascular coagulation in the endometrial lining which results in immediate blistering and blanching effect and which results in sub subsequent fibrosis okay so this will cause this endometrial ablation so this is the mechanism of action for this thermal balloon ablation now remember well these techniques this thermal balloon technique is contraindicated in presence of classic cesarean scar or transmural myomectomy now for this thermal ablation techniques endometrial preparation is not required okay because the endometrium is compressed by balloon pressure so endometrial preparation or thinning of endometrium is not required now another thing is bipolar radio frequency endometrial ablation so this is the most widely used second generation technique in uk okay so it is a bipolar radio frequency endometrial ablation this is the most commonly used second generation technique and the device is used is nova sure so you can see here this is the nova sure it is a uh, at the teeth of it there is an umbrella like uh, this thing a uh, projection actually this is a uh, once it enters the uterus you have to just inflate this and this umbrella will open and it will cause a uh, ablation effect okay so here exactly what happens is 
it this device comprises an electrode array that conforms to the counter of the uterine cavity and in built cavity integrated use case it uses a small amount of co2 to check any leak of perforation so this is the main active part and this will uh, occupy the uterine cavity and the radio frequency uh, energy generated through this device it will uh, propagate to the endometrium and it will cause the ablation and the time treatment or time cycle is 90 seconds to 120 seconds only so it is hardly takes 2 minutes to cause this endometrial ablation the endometrium is desiccated to the level of superficial myometrium the depth of penetration it is being determined by the impedance spec tube here also endometrium preparation is not necessary but the to pass this device at least dilatation up to 8 mm cervical dilatation up to 8 mm is required and pre insertion hysteroscopy should be done because it requires the dilatation so to rule out any perforation or false passage pre insertion hysteroscopy should be done now the third thing is hydrothermal ablation now this requires hysteroscopy so this is the hydrothermal ablation it is a second generation uh, technique which requires hysteroscopic vision here the endometrial destruction is achieved by circulating heated saline at 90 degree centigrade a tight seal at the cervix is essential to prevent leakage of hot liquid in the vagina according to the manufacturer the efficacy of product has not been established with cavity either less than 6 cm or more than 10.5 cm and for intramural fibroids more than 4 cm or with submucosal fibroids so these are all the contraindications cavity less than 6 cm cavity more than 10.5 cm intramural fibroids more than 4 cm or submucous fibroids this techniques it has the advantage of it is as it is performed under direct vision so irregular cavities or those with small fibroids they can be treated but the outcome data is not available yet now here uh, the one thing is there here it requires endometrial thinning so endometrial preparation is required for this hydrothermal ablation with gnrh agonist so as i told you what is the role of endometrial preparation in the preoperative hysteroscopy or endometrial biopsy so what they have told is here basically as i previously told also full endometrium and superficial myometrium up to 5 mm is destroyed and regeneration from this basal glands it is often a reason for treatment failure so wherever this basal glands are not ablated it is a reason for treatment failure so whenever in first generation techniques endometrial preparation with jnrh analogs is required but for second generation pre treatment is not required except for hydrothermal ablation now what they have recommended is either you have to take biopsy so endometrial atypia should be ruled out so either you can be do a pipel biopsy or you can take a soft suction biopsy at the time of ablation but it should not be by curata so curata should not be done you can take a pipel biopsy at the time of ablation okay if there is concern about appearance of endometrium or the integrity of cavity pre insertion hysteroscopy should be done and if there is any doubt then ablation should be abandoned now what is the role of contraception as you know endometrial ablation it is not a form of contraception okay uh, but it has to be performed only when, when the family is complete and the future fertility is not desired but still there is need to use effective contraception even after endometrial ablation because the pregnancy following ablation it occurs in around 0.7 percent of women and there are complications these are associated with this pregnancy okay so for that uh, you, also additional uh, tubal sterilization can be also done at the time of this endometrial ablation now regarding assure now as you know assure is not recommended okay assure that means hysteroscopic sterilization now it is not recommended in uk so now there is no question whether you can do this endometrial ablation along with issuer or not uh, because according to new guidelines issuer should not be used as a sterilization method but when this talk was there the issuer was used to be done so what they have given the recommendations regarding issuer is so all endometrial ablation techniques it can be taken with issuer but 
एम एच आर ए डजेंट रेकमेंड ओके एम एच आर ए डजेंट रेकमेंड साइमलटेनियस दैट मीन्स एब्लेशन एंड इश्योर ऑन द सेम डेट इज नॉट रेकमेंडेड बाय एम एच आर ए endometrial ablation should be only performed after the correct location of issuer micro inserts when it is confirmed by hsc okay that is usually you know after issuer after 3 months hsc should be done to see the correct placement of this micro inserts and after that only you can do ablation according to mhra and there is a small risk of stretching or removal of issuer while ablation which could compromise the efficacy of sterilization so post ablation hysteroscopic sterilization should be only considered if visualization and accurate localization of tubule spia is possible so before ablation if it is issuer is done at least after 3 months hsg should be done and then only it is done and if you want to do tubule sterilization after ablation by issuer then it can be done only if the ostia are visible now regarding outcomes of first generation and second generation endometrial ablation so the cochrane review of various endometrial ablation techniques did not find any significant difference between the amenorrhea rate quality of life and satisfaction rate in the first generation techniques so roller ball ablation and tcr they are uh, reported to be quite similar at around 10 years of follow up but only thing is roller ball is quicker to perform and achieves equivalent result but as i already told you tcre has advantage that it can provide tissue for biopsy so usually what it is done is tcre is done for uh, total endometrium while roller ball is reserved for the corneal regions and cesarean scar regions so for first generation satisfaction rate is up to 80% amenorrhea rate is up to 25 to 40% and need for hysterectomy in future is around 15 to 30% okay so for first generation techniques these are the outcomes now for second generation techniques again what they have found out is there is no that is the in comparison all techniques all second generation techniques they are similar satisfaction rate is around 80% amenorrhea rate is more with second generation that is up to 50% and hysterectomy rate is somewhat reduced up to 10 to 15% in case of second generation quality of life measurements they are significantly improved also dysmenorrhea that is pain associated with menstruation generally improved but in some cases it can worsen it is known as post ablation syndrome we will come to it later on okay uh, also the mechanism is not known but they have found out that improvement in premenstrual syndrome also okay with this endometrial ablation now when you compare first generation what's the second generation so there is no what they have found out in meta analysis or cochrane review is no significant difference between amenorrhea rate or patient satisfaction rate at one year the patient acceptability for either procedure it is similar but the second generation technique they have significantly shorter operative time also larger proportion of uh, procedures they can be performed under local anesthesia okay the as we can expect the perioperative and post operative complication and repeat surgery at 5 years they are lower with second generation but these are not these differences are not statistically significant now this is the most important statement in this talk is the rate of reoperation after for recurrent menstrual symptoms or for recurrent hmb following endometrial ablation so it is around 20 to 27% okay so reintervention is required in 20 to 27% of these 14 to 20% patient will have a hysterectomy by 5 years and majority of this hysterectomy will occur in first two years okay so 20% around 20 to 25% they will require reintervention of that 14 to 20% they will undergo hysterectomy by the end of 5 years and of which majority of hysterectomy they occur in the first two years now perioperative complications so compared to the first generation second generation techniques they are having fewer perioperative complication so overall complication rate for first generation technique is 4.4% and the majority is because of this distension media okay so for monopolar resection uh, resectoscopes this fluid overload because of uh, glycine it can lead to transurethral syndrome okay or uh, 
so transurethral resection syndrome these are specific to the first generation device and other perioperative complications like hemorrhage perforation cervical laceration they can occur with any technique but the incidence is lower with second generation technique also there remains a possibility of extra uterine thermal visceral damage if the perforation goes under recognized then there can be possibility of extra uterine thermal damage so women should be warned to seek medical assessment if they suffer from increasing abdominal pain loss of appetite or vomiting in the week after the ablation okay so there is always remains the risk of extra uterine thermal damage and what is this transurethral resection syndrome so this is the well recognized complication of first generation technique it is because due to glycine overload so it will cause hyponatremia hyperammonemia congestive heart failure hemolysis coma and in sometimes or rarely it can cause death so fluid balance is the fundamental part of operative setup and it requires careful measurement of input and output and the deficit level of 1.5 liters should be used as a reference mark to stop the procedure because deficit below these levels are not associated with metabolic changes but deficit when it exceeds 1.5 liter it may cause this transurethral resection syndrome and metabolic changes this problem it can be negated by using bipolar resectoscopes where normal saline is used so still overload can occur overload can occur congestive cardiac failure can occur but metabolic disturbances will be very less with this normal saline overload now laser ablation it carries the highest risk of fluid overload followed by tcre so the highest risk of glycine overload is with laser uh, ablation followed by tcre and lastly it is roller ball ablation but the laser ablation uses normal saline so the metabolic disturbances will be lower with laser ablation okay so this is the chart which <coughs> it is given in the talk regarding the complications of first generation and second generation techniques so you can see all our complications are somewhat less like hemorrhage is lesser with second generation perforation is lesser with second generation but cervical laceration they occurs more commonly with second generation because it requires dilatation right cervical dilatation endometritis is also common with second generation while hematometroid is lesser with second generation now long term complications of ablation is one is infection so infection it can uh, present as endometritis myometritis pid pelvic abscess pyometra or septicemia as you know infection will present as pyrexia offensive vaginal discharge with uterine or adnexal tenderness it usually responds to the conservative treatment with antibiotics but sometimes it requires drainage of abscess or pyometra and in rare cases it may require hysterectomy but the prophylactic antibiotics it is not routinely recommended because it is still it is debatable but only thing it is recommended for tcre where the vessels are open so pre operative or prophylactic antibiotics are only recommended for tcre while in other uh, procedures the role is debatable now the pregnancy related complications as i said pregnancy occurs in 0.7% after this ablation so if this pregnancy occurs there are increased chances of adverse outcomes like miscarriage ectopic preterm birth iugr abnormal placentation uterine rupture cesarean increase incidence of cesarean section and tph these are all complications which are associated with pregnancy after this ablation now what is the post ablation syndrome so this is the syndrome which is characterized characterized by either new onset or significant worsening of pain during menstruation it is due to obstruction of menstruation following uterine scarring and synecy formation sometimes hematometra may occur in case with complete cervical stenosis or synecy formation it may cause compartmentalization so it will cause isolated hematometra which is usually located in corneal region so because this is the most common area which is spared during the ablation treatment sometimes this pain is because of pre existing adenomyosis also post ablation tubal sterilization syndrome is another recognized complication where sterilization is combined with ablation so here the main symptom is cyclical unilateral or bilateral pelvic pain with spotting the mechanism is mechanism for pain is retrograde menstruation with obstruct 
in the obstructed fallopian tube which results in distension of fallopian tube the incidence may vary from 6 to 8 percent so this is regarding post ablation tubal sterilization syndrome it usually respond to the treatment is removal of fallopian tube but the definitive treatment for both this that is post ablation syndrome and post ablation tubal sterilization syndrome so for both syndromes definitive treatment is hysterectomy limitations of endometrial ablation is because you cannot take any uh, sample for tissue sample from the cavity so the cavity remains difficult for future evaluation in case of post menopausal bleeding but still it has not been linked with increase incidence of endometrial cancer cavity remains uh, that is uh, difficult for future evaluation but the risk of endometrial cancer is not increased hysterectomy is more cost effective than endometrial ablation now in a uh, second generation techniques this they are cheaper and also they are associated with more quality associated life years so better quality or better prognosis is associated is observed with second generation techniques so they are preferred ablation uh, choice okay in case of women with more than one previous cesarean section or previous uterine surgery like myomectomy or in case of congenital malformation the preferred option is to treat the endometrial cavity using roller ball so in all these cases the choice of ablation technique is roller ball ablation that is first generation ablation technique also as i told you for repeat ablation also roller ball ablation is the recommended choice repeat ablation it is associated with higher risk complication rates are twice as that of uh, first time ablation and success rate is only 30% so this is regarding this hmb part 1 talk so now we will come to the questions yes anyone has doubt someone has i think dr bj you have type for thermal balloon at first deflation so yes yes uh, actually deflated balloon is inserted and then it will be inflated okay it is not pre how you will inflate the how will you insert the pre inflated balloon in through the cervix correct because it is the hot uh, hot liquid is circulated in the cavity so you are going to insert the deflated balloon and then you are going to inflate the balloon with the hot liquid okay okay so this is the first question 45 year old woman with hmb she has been referred for secondary care she is examined and uterus is found to be equivalent of 10 weeks ultrasound suggestive of presence of small intramural fibroids what is the surgical treatment option Yes, completed her family. So yes, it is as she has completed a family. The first choice will be endometrial ablation. Yes, Akshita has asked, do we have to remember the percentage? Actually, not not necessary to remember the percentage for complications, individual complications. No, not necessary to remember the percentage. But final percentage you have to remember. That means how many how many patients require hysterectomy, and uh, what is the uh, incidence of HMB? These are the important things that you should remember. so answer for this question is endometrial ablation next question is it has been estimated that risk of having hysterectomy for persistent menstrual symptoms is 14 to 20% so when after the surgery the risk of hysterectomy is greatest yes it is in the first two years answer is e okay so this is regarding this part 1 hmb talk tomorrow we will discuss this part 2 and there they have discussed myomectomy and hysterectomy in detail okay so tomorrow's talk is also very important because this treatment modalities has been uh, not discussed anywhere else and it is regularly asked regarding the hysterectomy regarding the myomectomy and all these things okay so tomorrow's talk is also important so thank you girl today for attending not girls all are all are there thank you friends okay then bye thank you ma'am